Hi everyone. Uh, in this lecture, I'll discuss about the Miller's theorem. Now, I have used a, a kind of an application of Miller's theorem in the previous lecture. Though it's not very obvious, we'll see how did I use it. And we'll also try to give some intuitions for Miller's theorem. We'll try to look at it in a slightly different way. Okay. So, if you already thought of this, well and good. Otherwise, we'll be learning something new. So, what is Miller's theorem is that, so when I... Let's say we have uh, two nodes, I am showing here node 1 and node 2 and the voltages between the two nodes are related by a, a gain factor A and then we have an impedance connecting the two nodes. Now what happens in circuit analysis is that, so when I have an impedance connecting those two nodes, when you, under, when you actually try to use normal circuit analysis, uh, for example if this node is driven by an additional circuit and so on then the analysis becomes a little complicated. So, to simplify the analysis, we use this Miller's theorem. What is, what is Miller's theorem do is that, now this impedance Z is actually connecting the, the, these two nodes. Okay, So, there is actually some current flowing between these two nodes. The Miller's theorem splits this impedance and, and, and splits them into two different impedances as seen by this node Vx with, with the potential Vx and again the node with the potential AVX as two impedances referred to a common ground. See again, I didn't say this, VX is a voltage measured with respect to some common ground. Both AVX and VX are measured with respect to some common ground. Now if you see, it has converted this circuit to two non-interacting nodes. Previously these two nodes were interacting, there was a current flowing between the two nodes. But now we have converted it to an equivalent circuit where there is no direct physical connection between the two nodes. There is no current flowing between the two nodes. So, we will try to see some intuitions as to how did this result come about. So, to begin that, we will start with a very simple problem which we already discussed in the last lecture. So, I started with the problem that if I had an impedance where one node, the voltage at one node was Vx and the voltage at other node was minus Vx. And then we said that we can split this impedance into two halves, Z by 2 and Z by 2 and then such that the center, the, the node that is connecting the two impedances will be at AC ground and we already showed how to prove this result that at very, uh, I mean you can easily show that by applying the principle of superposition. Uh, if you apply, assume this node voltage is 0 first and find the node voltage here due to minus Vx and do the opposite. So, you can assume minus Vx is 0 and then find the node voltage here due to plus Vx and you will see it is 0 volts. So, this circuit, I am not. I am just now going to separate the grounds and then say the circuit is going to reduce something like this. In fact, the grounds are not really separated. Miller's theorem says the, the, the ground is a common ground. The interesting part to note here is that even though again this ground, there is no current flowing inside the ground. You know, the, it's actually the current flows through this and it, it has a return path through the minus Vx, the minus Vx uh, source. You know, if let's say I have connected a source or some circuit there, we will later see how does the return path come about. Okay, So, this is something we discussed in the last lecture. So, what I am saying is I will start with an impedance z and try to split it into two halves. So, that just that the sum of the two is two impedances will be equal to this Miller, the, the, the impedance where we started with that is z. And then we can for, for the ease of analysis, we can simply split those two impedances this way. Now, to recall where did I use this? Uh, we started with this problem that what happens when I have a load resistance and an, an equal load and source resistance R and R connected this way and when we had a resistance R naught in between, I said that because we know that these two node voltages, so the output voltage and the source node voltage, they were simply negatives of each other, so meaning they both, they both are 180 degrees out of phase, V naught was simply equal to minus Vs. So, we discussed that R0 can be split as R0 by 2 and R0 by 2 and then you can simply model this R0 by 2 in parallel with this and do the analysis. The analysis became much simpler. And uh, so, here we are, what we are trying to show is that in fact, this in fact is a consequence of Miller effect. So, what did, what did we do in Miller effect is that, so what do we do in Miller effect? So, we have the voltage V here, the gain here is minus 1. So, Z by 1 minus A. So, this is actually Z by 1 minus A. We will we'll quickly derive that result uh, in, in a few moments. 
1 minus a here a is minus 1 so you get z by 2 and similarly here z by 1 minus 1 by a that's the impedance for a Miller, Miller uh, theorem from Miller's theorem and again you get z by 2. So from Miller's theorem you can even derive these two impedance values as seen by vx and minus vx. So now it looks like the circuit I'm just I've just reduced this circuit here such that these two now look like truly non-interacting nodes. But you should understand the current path previously the current was flowing from plus vx to minus vx okay and I'm sorry here it is minus vx here it's minus vx it was flowing from plus vx to minus vx and that condition still holds so for example let's say I'm driving it with a voltage source which is plus vx and an impedance z is connected here and say we have a dependent source whose value is minus vx okay with a gain of minus one voltage dependent voltage source so we have a current flowing from here and then the loop is completed the return path is in this way now what we are saying here is that we are going to approximate this circuit to something like this so this is z by 2 and this is minus vx and again we have z by 2 here okay so again the voltages are measured with respect to a common ground so i'll assume these these two grounds are the same now even though we have assumed that these two nodes don't change i mean they are ac ground i can assume that these two potentials are also the same but you need to understand the return path for the current will not be through this point i mean there will be no current so what do i mean here is that so even though i have modeled the impedance z by 2 alongside vx the return path for the current will not be like this so that's all i'm trying to say because every voltage source we discussed in passive circuits that if a current is flowing out of the voltage source the same current should return back because that that comes from kcl okay so the total current diverging at any node in the circuit is uh, zero. It it follows from that's that that's a vectorial. Uh, I've just put it in ve vectorially wording that KCL. Now in this circuit, what would happen is that the current will flow like this, like this, and eventually it will trace this path, and again it will come back. But for circuit analysis purposes, we will treat this as Z by two and do the analysis, and you will get the same answers. Okay, and you will get the same answer. The very important constraint for Miller's theorem here is that the node voltage, the 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 node voltage. I didn't state that condition here, but the node voltage V x and A V x are related to each other. There is a relationship, and that relationship is independent of what you connect between the two nodes. So that's a very important condition. We will later take some examples where we will see if I start using this Miller's theorem, I will not get accurate results. So this A here, the gain or the relationship between this node voltage and this node voltage should be independent of what you connect in between them. Okay, then you can apply the Miller's theorem easily. Now we will generalize this result. So what did we discuss is that if I take an impedance Z and we started with the problem of Vx and minus Vx, we said simply can we just split it into two halves, Z by 2 and Z by 2 then there will be some node in between so i mean i can split this impedance into in such a way such that there will be some node in between the two impedances which will have no variations okay so that's the goal our goal is to find that so now we will generalize this and then go start discussing the miller's theorem itself so i'll start with an impedance uh, say the gain here is plus a and you have connected an impedance between these two nodes now I need to split these impedances so for example I need to split this two impedances into two halves so or, or two parts so the first part I'm going to call it z into x the other impedance is z into 1 minus x so let's say this is vx and this is a times vx then we need to split it in such a way such that the point that is connecting the two impedances should be at zero the change in the potential should be nearly zero there. So again, to find the result, you can just use superposition, principle of, super, principle of superposition, or you can just equate the currents here. You know, we know the current entering here should be equal to the current leaving. There is no current flowing here through this node. The current flowing through this node is Vx by Z into X. Uh, and uh, this the current that is leaving this node uh, will be equal to the current leaving the node. So it will be equal to uh, Vx into A by Z into 1 minus X. So if you just solve this equation, 
So Vx and Vx cancels out, Z and Z cancels out. You'll get a result x equals 1 by 1 minus a. So that's how you get this result. You can split this resistor into two parts. So what I did, I took Z and then split the resistor into two parts, Z by 1 minus a and Z by 1 minus 1 by a. Again, uh, this is I've assumed this is Z into x and this is Z into 1 minus x. We just found for this node voltage to be 0 or for this node voltage to be the point where the two impedances are connected to each other, for that node voltage to not have any variations, x should be equal to 1 by 1 minus a. Okay. So now when I substitute 1 minus x, I am going to get z into minus a by 1 minus a. So if I take a to the denominator, I will get this result. So this is your Miller's theorem. So Miller's theorem can be intuitively seen as some kind of an impedance splitting problem. I am just splitting the impedances into two parts such that the point that is joining the two impedances should not see any AC variations. Now if I do that, it becomes easier for me to analyze it. Now if you see the current through this is purely determined by V and the impedance that is seen by this voltage source. So now I can just treat them like two non-interacting nodes with the impedances Z by 1 minus A and Z by 1 minus 1 by A connected to them. And I can do all the analysis. So all this is still valid under the assumption that A V X and V X are related to each other by a gain A and that is independent of what you connect between them. The impedance Z has no effect on the gain. At a later stage, I will again revisit Miller's theorem when we talk about uh, Miller's theorem in, high, in, the, in the frequency response of amplifiers. At that point, we will, we will later see that uh, we can't directly use these results because most MOS amplifiers are transconductance amplifiers. They are not voltage amplifiers. So the gain actually is a function of the impedance that you connect. So how do we modify Miller's theorem in that case? We will talk about that when we go to uh, the frequency response of uh, single stage amplifiers. So right now, I mainly wanted to ex talk about Miller's theorem in low frequencies. Okay. And how did we use it? I mean, we did use Miller's theorem, but not it was not very obvious. And also, I will try to use Miller's theorem in a slightly more complicated problem. I mean, uh, the source regenerated uh, MOS amplifier problem. And then see how it can be applied there. Okay, so again the same problem. So now uh, if I have a gain minus uh, minus a v x, so this is something we more commonly encounter. Again, there is a small typo here. So this is if v x and minus v x we connect a resist impedance z between v x and minus v x, the impedances are going to be z by one minus z by one by one plus a and z by uh, one plus one by a. Okay. So this is more familiar for us because we will often be seeing amplifiers where impedance is connected between two nodes which are out of phase with each other. Okay, and they, they may have some relationship. The gain uh, will be greater than one or less than one. In the trivial problem and a very simpler problem which we discussed a few moments ago was the case where we showed here that uh, R0 was connected between two equal impedances and the voltages V0 and Vs were just equal to each other with but I mean the opposites of each other meaning they were 180 degrees out of phase. In that case the resistance turned out to be just R0 by 2 or the splitting resistance value was simply Z by 2. So this is the problem which we discussed will wherein we took an example of uh, a MOSFET with equal source and drain resistors reduces to the case. So now if you notice this whether I connect R0 or not it does not matter because the current flowing through this is same as the current flowing through this. So I drain into R, your V0 and V source are always 180 degrees out of phase and they are they always satisfy this relationship. Whether you keep changing R0, they have no impact. R0 has no impact on it. So that is why there we can apply this Miller's theorem and split R0 into two parts. So I can write it here as R0 by 2 and R0 by 2 here. And this is what we discussed in the last class. It's a very simple example of an application of Miller's theorem. I didn't use the word Miller's theorem in the last class. I just told that, you know, you can split the resistor into two halves. Now, Miller's theorem is a more generalized version of the same result, wherein we, we took an impedance connected between two nodes, uh, which were differential, I would say. Now, we'll talk about that later, what is differential. So, they were exactly 180 degrees out of phase and magnitudes were same. Then we said that we could split this as R by 2 and R by 2. Miller's theorem is a more generalized version of the same problem. We are splitting in such a way such that the node that is joining the two impedances will come to 0 volts.
So that's the main uh, criterion here. So if you have to solve that, you will get these expressions. So finally, this is more of a more generalized uh, expression. Uh, again, uh, there is. So for example, let's say I connect it between two nodes V1 and V2. Okay. And these two node voltages V2 by V1, we can even call it as the gain or I'll just call it V2 by V1. Okay. And in that case, I can again split this as two resistors Z1, two impedances Z1 and Z2. Again, this is between V1 and V2 here. There is a small typo there again. I can split this as split this impedance into two halves, I mean two parts, Z1 and Z2. And if you solve for this problem again, you will get Z by 1 minus V2 by V1 and Z by 1 minus V1 by V2. Okay, so now if you, there are some interesting results here. So for example, let's assume we as we'll assume that V2. We'll take an example uh, where I'm going to assume that V2. I have a resistor R and I've connected it between V1 and the other end of this node is at say plus two V1, plus two V1. So your we can actually split the resistors into two halves, uh, two halves such that this will be minus R and this will be plus two R. So again, it follows from the uh, Miller's theorem. So you will get R by 1 minus A here. And here it is R by 1 minus 1 by 2. So you will get 2 R here. And this would be ground. So now if you see when I apply Miller's theorem in this problem, I am getting a negative resistance here. Okay. And that should not that should make a sense because so if I have a voltage source V i, which is or V 1 in this case, is connected here and we have another source let's let's assume this is a dependent source so which is two times v1 then we can see that current is actually flowing a current of value v1 by r is actually flowing into this voltage source so as far as this voltage source is concerned this negative resistance will look like a negative resistance because if I apply a voltage the current that is flowing into this will be v1 by r because whenever current is flowing into the node it look i mean it is actually you can say that the current or the power is delivered to this voltage source and this voltage source is actually uh, delivering it okay or, or so this voltage source is absorbing the power and that is possible only when you connect a negative resistance so if i connect a negative resistance here and v1 with a voltage source then this negative resistance will actually deliver power to this voltage source for practical resistors it will always voltage source will always deliver power to them and resistors will only absorb power but for a negative resistance the resistors can actually deliver power as well. Okay, it it will always sorry it will always deliver power. So if you look at the uh, the Miller Miller equivalent, it will be a negative resistance as far as V one is concerned, and that makes sense because the current is actually flowing into this node, and so that's how you would get the negative resistance. Okay, again if I assume V one is greater than V two this V2 will see a negative resistance. If I assume this V1, so this node voltage is say V2 and this node voltage is say V1. If you assume V1 is greater than V2, okay. If V1 is greater than V2, in that case, this resistance will become negative. Okay, V1 is greater than V2, current will actually flow from V1 into V2. Okay, so since current is being delivered to the voltage or whatever the dependent source at V2, you can say that V2 will see this as a negative resistor because current has to be delivered here. So all, all these things, again, you should keep in mind that when we derived all these results, so even though I'm drawing it as a ground here, uh, you shouldn't confuse this is say V1 and this is Z by 1 minus V2 by V1. I've split this as two impedances. Z by 1 minus V1 by V2. So again, as I said, these two grounds are same. You should always keep in mind that the return path doesn't really happen this way. Okay. It actually goes through, the grounds are all same. It actually goes through this device, this, this resistor and this impedance and then returns back this way. So the path will be something like this. Okay. There will be no current flowing uh, there will be no current flowing into this node. Okay, there is no current flowing into the ground. There is no return path through this. This is not there. Okay, Mathematically, we are just drawing a model 
which gives you the same results that if you do a rigorous analysis of the system with an interacting impedance between the two nodes, you will get, for example, if I had V1 and an impedance Z and V2, you will get the same answers by analyzing it here as you do it by using the Miller's theorem. The only difference is that using Miller's theorem, the analysis becomes very, very simple. And the conditions to keep in mind when applying Miller's theorem is that you have to ensure that V2 and V1, the node voltages, the ratio of the node voltages is independent of what you connected in between them. The ratio, especially the ratio should be independent of what you connected between the two nodes. So we'll take some examples and where we'll see, we'll apply Miller's theorem and where we'll, we'll also see examples where it fails. Okay. So uh, I'll start with a very simple problem, which is say we have a load resistance RL, the source de degenerated MOS amplifier, and uh, it has a finite R0 here. So I'm showing R0 explicitly. Uh, okay, in the I'm not showing it in the small single model, but rather I'm directly showing it in between the drain to source. So we know this for, for this circuit, for this source degenerated MOS amplifier, V0 by Vs is simply equal to minus RL by R. Now, no matter whether R0 is there or not, this has no impact. So this ratio is always maintained. So now if you see, uh, we have a condition where I can apply, the R0 is present in between. Now we discussed how to analyze or how to solve this problem. The analysis becomes a little bit more complicated. We, we, we resorted to going for Thevenin equivalent and then solving it when you had R0. When R0 was not there, it was a simpler problem to solve. We just uh, we just simply said that if you apply a voltage VI here, the effective, we just try to find the drain current. We use the word effective transconductance. We said it will be GM by 1 plus GMR times VI times RL with a negative sign will be the voltage. So this is, this is your drain current. Your output voltage is simply minus ID times RL. And we got this gain as minus in, minus of GM RL by 1 plus GMR. So we know the analysis of this circuit is pretty simple, but the moment we add R0, the analysis becomes more complicated. So now what we can do is we'll use Miller's theorem for this circuit and split R0 into two halves. So we, I'm going to split R0 into two parts, not exactly halves. So this is going to be, we know the gain is minus of RL by R. So this node is connected to RL and this node is connected to RS. So this resistor is going to be R0 by 1 minus A, so it will be R0, one, which will be 1 plus RL by R. And this resistor is going to be R0 by 1 plus R by RL, 1 by A. Okay. So and then if you do the analysis, you will get the same expressions that we derived in the last class. Now the problem is now simpler. You can just, you can just model this resistor in parallel with RS, the value of this is here. And similarly, this resistor can also be modeled in parallel with RL. So this is R0 by 1 plus R by RL. And we know how to analyze this circuit. Okay, it's, 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 it reduces to a very simple form. We, we analyze for a special case, I, I did apply this result of splitting the resistors into two parts. Uh, for a special case when RL was equal to R, or, or sorry, this is, I've written R as here, it was RL was equal to R. That was a special case we discussed in the previous lecture. Now I've just shown a generalized case. I mean, what I was trying to say is that the previous lecture, we did use Miller's theorem, but we didn't explicitly state it. But now we are stating it and then uh, we're, I'm just trying to show how you can apply that. And we'll take a very simple example, other example, and then show where it fails. So for example, I'll take this circuit which is a common gate amplifier and I have connected a resistance R0 here. And I'm interested in finding out what is the resistance seen here or rather I'll just apply say VI here and this is say V0. Now I'll try to split R0 into two halves using Miller's theorem. Now we know the gain from this point to this point is 1 plus GM R0. So using that, I can split R0 into two halves. So this is going to be R0 by 1 minus A. So that will be 1 minus 1 plus GM R0. So you will get minus GM R0. And uh, that will again further reduce to minus 1 by GM. So we can, in fact, for the other resistor, we don't even have to apply, uh, you know, 
uh, Miller's theorem, you can directly say that some of the two resistors should be equal to R0. Using that, I can directly say it's going to be R0 minus 1 by GM. Okay, sorry, R0 plus 1 by GM. So that's how we can directly write that. So in fact, you can use this result. So R0 by 1 minus 1 by 1 plus GM R0. If you just solve this, you will simply get it as R0 plus 1 by GM. I directly wrote it because we know the sum of the two resistors is equal to R0. And this one was minus 1 by GM. So I just have to add plus 1 by GM to it. Now, when you connect it back to the circuit, okay, now I'm actually trying going to model this negative resistance here uh, with respect to the input. I'm going to refer it to the input and then say this is minus 1 by GM. And similarly, the output resistance, I'm going to model it as R0 plus 1 by GM. Now we'll try and find what is the input impedance. So first, if you look at this circuit, we have already derived the expression for the input impedance and the output impedance of this circuit. So when you look here at this part, the input impedance is infinity because there is no current that is drawn here. That's because this is open, the current drawn here is zero. And that's same as the current that is entering here, which is also zero. So if I apply a finite voltage VI, I'm going to get zero current. So the input resistance was infinity, is infinity. And that's what we discussed in one of the previous lectures. And similarly, to find the outputs, output resistance, okay, so uh, we have to keep in mind to find the resistance seen by this node. I'm not going to ground this node, okay. I'm not, I'm not really going to ground this node. But if I float it, if I just float it, or I can treat a problem like this. Let's say I apply VI here, and then try to find what is the output impedance seen at this node, or our input impedance seen at this node. Okay, and I'll, I'll probably talk about that uh, once I finish discussing the input impedance. Okay, let me first start with the input impedance. So for an input impedance, if, if let's say we take a MOS device with R0 as infinity, no matter what you connect it at the load, at the load, if I apply a voltage VI, I'm going to have a current GM VI flowing through this. So which means the input impedance is going to be simply 1 by GM. Only when we connected R0, we saw that the input impedance can become zero. If you make sure that ZL is significantly large, then the input impedance can become infinity. It, it becomes a function of ZL when you introduce R0. Before we introduce R0, we said that it was always equal to 1 by GM. So using these two results, I can say that the resistance seen at this node, it's going to be 1 by GM. So it will be one, minus 1 by GM in parallel with plus 1 by GM. So this is nothing but infinity. So it will when you connect two resistors, uh, negative and positive resistor of equal value in parallel, you are going to, that's going to behave like an open circuit. And we had already discussed that. So if I have Z and minus Z in parallel, so any voltage I apply here, no current is going to be drawn here. That's because if Z is going to draw a certain amount of current, minus Z is going to provide that current back. So the, there will be a path for current will be simply through the two impedances. No current will be drawn from the input voltage source. So finite input voltage source, no current being drawn. So the input impedance seen here will simply be infinity. So the input impedance is infinity. And we showed it using Miller's theorem. Now similarly, I'll take a different circuit. I'll take the same circuit. Now I'm going to drive it at this node using a voltage source. And this will be my output. So say this is VI and I'm trying to find the output voltage here. We have already discussed this circuit. If uh, this node is open here, then when you look into the drain terminal, the input, output, input impedance is going to be infinity because since no current is flowing here, no current flows through this as well. So the R out, I mean, in this case, I'll, I'll call it as R out. That's the impedance seen at this node when you're driving it with the voltage source is infinity. Now, if I try to use Miller's theorem, the voltage gain here, V0 will simply be 1 by 1 plus GMR0 times VI. Now, if I try to use Miller's theorem, the resistance seen at this node, at this node, it's simply going to be R0 by 1 minus A. A in this case is 1 plus GMR0. And that is simply going to be R0 plus 1 by GM. So what you will get here is actually a model like this. So you're going to get R0 plus 1 by GM and source is open. Now, if I apply a voltage source here, okay, source is open and for, for, for the time being, I'll assume that 
there is a, a resistance Rs and I'm, the limit I'm making Rs tend to infinity. So if I actually, for uh, if I just take a single MOS device with R0 as infinity and connect a finite source resistance, the resistance looking to the drain is always infinity because no matter what you change this drain potential, there will be no current because of this drain change, potent change in the drain potential in the circuit. So which means the impedance seen into the drain is infinity. So using that, I can say this impedance is infinity, but the impedance seen here is going to be R0 plus 1 by GM. And we just discussed for this circuit R out, that is impedance seen at this node was simply infinity. So here, by applying Miller's theorem, I was not getting the right answer. I'm, I'm not getting the right answer. So this is where the Miller's theorem fails because you have to keep in mind that the gain here is a function of R0. So it doesn't work in this case. We will again, as I said, we, when we discuss about frequency response of amplifiers, uh, we will again see that Miller's theorem will not give you exact results of the impedances that you will be seeing, especially an example I'll take. So if let's say we take a MOS device and connect an impedance Z between these two terminals. So I can simply with say VI is A times VI minus A times VI. So modeling it this way, Z by 1 plus A is not, is, is not going to give you a very accurate results. We will talk about this later when we start discussing the frequency response. So where there we will be using the word called Miller effect where the capacitance gets multiplied. And, that's a, and that happens because of Miller's theorem. It's a consequence of Miller's theorem. So uh, in the next lecture, I'll start with the discussion of some problems on single stage amplifiers. And after that, we'll move on to the discussions of multi-stage amplifiers.